Pentecost, you see the red up here, you see the red lights are changed, and you see red everywhere, which of course is the red telling us the Holy Spirit is at work, the spirit of the, fu- the fire of the Spirit is at work in us, and of course in his word. And that's what our focus is on today. So we ask God's blessing as we worship him today. Uh, we will follow page 15 with the order of communion this morning, and we'll start with our first posted hymn, hymn 182. Please rise. Once again, I invite you to turn to page 15 in the front of Christian Worship Hymnal as we join in the common service with Holy Communion this morning. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart to confess our sins to God our Father, asking him, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity but I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and he's given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all our sins. Therefore, as a called servant,
works of our Lord Jesus as we read today our sermon text also from John's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 5 through 11. Praise be to you, o Lord. But now I am going away to him who sent me, and not one of you asks me, where are you going? Yet because I have told you these things, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is good for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. About judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. This is the gospel of our Lord. To you, o Christ. We turn to pages 18 and 19 in the front of the hymnal as we confess together our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed, 18 and 19. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you may be seated. We join together then in our next posted hymn, hymn number 176.
in the name of Christ Jesus, the one who sent from the Father, whom the Holy Spirit uses through the word of God to convict us of those eternal truths in his word, brothers and sisters in Christ. This is all for your good. You ever said that to your children? Have you as a child heard that from your parents? Are you still hearing that? <laughs> this is going to be for your good. You'll see. This will turn out for good. This will be good for you. In one way or another, we hear them. Do we always like to hear those words, though? <laughs> Come on, let's be honest. Usually we're in a situation where we don't want to be or we don't quite understand what's going on. Or maybe it's coming. And there's something that's going to happen in our lives and we don't really understand why or we don't really want it to happen in our lives. But someone comes along and says, this is going to happen and it's going to be good for you. <laughs> kind of hard to see that right now in the world, isn't it? But that's what Jesus says today. He says it to his disciples and he says it to you and me today as we're still kind of in that section. If you joined us last Sunday, we're in that section from chapter 13 through 17 and today we back up a chapter to chapter 16. Remember Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples. He told them they were all going to fall away. He washed their feet. He told them the greatest commandment is to love. He told them I am the truth and the way and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. He told them to stay connected to him as a branch to the vine. He told them, chapter 16, you're going to have to suffer. If you want to follow me, don't be surprised then if there are people that come into your life that actually think that by killing God's messengers, they're doing God's work. Jesus actually tells that to his disciples today, right before he says the words of our text. He starts off this way, It is good for you that I go away, because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. What good could possibly come from Jesus going away? He's their master. He's their teacher. They've been with him. They've been walking with him. And he's kind of been in control of everything going on. What could possibly happen that's good if Jesus leaves, especially in the way he's been talking? I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die at the hands of my enemies. You're all going to fall away. But don't worry. I have to go. It's going to be good for you. Because I'm going to send somebody else, the counselor, the helper, in Greek, it's the paraclete, if you want to go look that deep. It's the one who stands alongside the child and teaches them everything and stands with them and sits with them and counsels them. That's why the translation uses the word counselor. It's, it's all those things combined, and that's what Jesus is doing today. He's telling us, yes, I'm going to suffer. Yes, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to ascend up into heaven, as we heard last week. I'm going to sit at the right hand of God and intercede for you, but I am going to leave in order that I would send someone back to convict you, convict all of the world. And when I use the word convict today, it's not a conviction in the sense of you're guilty, but convict in the sense of convince. And that's what Jesus does today Using the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, He convicts us, convinces us and the world about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. As you already heard me read today, right? So what's He mean by that? Stay with me. We'll find out. If anybody needed to be convicted about sin, I think it was probably those disciples. I mean, especially at this time. Remember what they were arguing about? Who's going to be the greatest among us, right? Who's going to sit next to Jesus? Or I had this, this happen with Jesus when I was with him, and so I'm going to sit next to him. I'm the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And all the while, Jesus is hearing all these things going on, as he knows. And it's almost like he's saying, you guys, are, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what you're about to undergo. You have no idea what you need me to do for you. He would tell them that, right? He would tell them, you're all going to fall away. He would tell uh, Judas, one of you will betray me. And maybe even earlier than that, 
you might remember a specific conversation that Peter had with Jesus. It's the one that Peter, remember Jesus said, I'm going to be put to death by my enemies. And Peter would say, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not going to happen. Jesus, you're still speaking nonsense. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. And Jesus turns to him, you remember the words, right? Get behind me, Satan, yeah. He calls Peter, one of his followers, Satan, because Satan was trying to tempt Jesus. Don't go through what you said you were going to do. Don't keep your father's plan. Don't do what you came to do to suffer and to die for the world. Now, how is that telling the disciples about their sin? I hope you understand. First of all, when Jesus is speaking to the disciples about their sin, he's really talking to them and to us and to the whole world about the very reason why he needed to come. Just think about this. If Jesus came and if, if it was easy for him to go through the suffering and the death of, of the sin for the whole world, if that was so easy, then why when they're about to go over to the Garden of Gethsemane, maybe you remember again what happens in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus goes away three times to pray and the disciples fall asleep half the time. And Jesus, as he's praying, maybe you remember, there's so much stress going on in Jesus' mind. There's drops of blood and sweat coming down because there's no other way. This is the only way it can be done. Okay, Father, so be it. If the stress going up to the death of Jesus to pay for the very world's sins, yours and mine included, was so much, then how can we say that sin isn't that big a deal? Uh, Jesus says this because really in the end, if people don't recognize their sin, then they're not going to believe in him. They don't need Jesus. I don't know about you, but do you pay attention to the way that people talk about Jesus today in our world? Maybe sometimes even the way we think about Jesus? Do, do, you, do you ever hear Jesus is, he, other than being completely rejected, uh, Jesus is maybe, he's just a, he's just a fun-loving guy that I, I, he, he's there and he'll go on amusement park rides with me and he'll, he'll have fun with me in life, and he'll, but he'll let me do whatever I want. There's really no consequences for Jesus because he's all forgiving and all loving and, and this God of love, he, he'll forgive anything in, from anyone and there's a kernel of truth to that, yes. But that's not all Jesus is. He's not just a fun-loving, oh, I'll look the other way. If you're going to completely offend me and do whatever is completely in, in opposition to my word and will. Uh, I'll look the other way if you choose to believe in other gods besides me. I'll, I'll just kind of overlook that and, and, and it won't be that big a deal. If it's not that big a deal, then why is the suffering so severe that Jesus willingly underwent for us and all of his disciples? And that's where when Jesus says, I'm going to go through all of this suffering... I'm going to go through this death. I'm going to rise again, which, to be honest, the disciples, I don't think they even heard that part. <laughs> and then he says, I'm going to leave again. But I am going to send someone here that you will need. And that someone we know as the Holy Spirit today on this day of Pentecost, that someone is going to use the word of God and it's going to con he's going to convict you of your sin. See, without the Holy Spirit, we call this kind of the strange, the, if you want to call it foreign work, the alien work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does is uses the Word of God and it tells us not only of our sin, but, and here's the real strange thing the Holy Spirit does, it shows us how much we can't do anything to get rid of our sin and how much we absolutely need a Savior to come from outside of us. Remember, we're conceived and born in sin and all we can do is sin on our own and that's all we can do until Jesus comes. And so that's why when Jesus says, I have to come first, yes, to do everything that I'm supposed to do for you in behalf of you and instead of you, but I'm going to leave because I need to do that too, but you're not going to be left alone. I'm sending the Holy Spirit back to you to convict you of this truth. You're a sinner in need of a Savior. I'm going to convict you and the rest of the world about your sin, yes, 
but I'm also going to convict you and the rest of the world about righteousness. Righteousness, it's a long word for basically someone who has the feelings, the motivation, the opinions, the truths, the words, the actions, all of it that falls in line with God's will. They're right in God's sight, both inside and out. Now, who of us can look in the mirror of God's law or even look in the regular mirror and say, that's me? We can't. You can't find any of that in all of humanity. You can't counsel it into someone. You can't genetically modify someone to make them sinless. The whole human race is this way. And, and because we are this way, we are filled with sin. What does sin do? It separates. It divides. Sin separates us from life. It separates us from eternity with our Savior. It separates us from the ability to be able to love unconditionally, whether it be our family, our spouse, our friends, and yes, very much evident when it comes to loving our enemies. We can't do that. And so all that sin does is it separates. Now along comes righteousness. What does righteousness do? Righteousness actually does the opposite. When it is done by someone, again, it has to be done by someone completely outside of us, righteousness is what brings together, makes right, makes at peace. And of course, we said it has to come from outside the human race, which is why Jesus says, I'm going to send it to you in my word. I'm going to send it to you in Christ Jesus. I'm going to send it to you from the Father. But you're no longer going to see me anymore. Because when you see me through the word of God, which I relied on anyway, then you'll see the love of the Father. When you see me, then the Holy Spirit will also be there to convict you of the righteousness that I came to bring. Isn't that kind of the message of the entire Bible, the book that God gives to us? Jesus' righteousness in place of us? That's the great exchange, isn't it? Our sin, the sin of the whole world, he takes on himself. And in place of that sin, the one who has perfect motivation, the one who has perfect feelings, the one who has perfect, perfect opinion, the one who has perfect obedience to the Father, both inside and out, the one who is perfect in every way, he takes his place as the worst of all sinners. And that makes about as much sense as somebody who's completely innocent of every charge of, of, of murder going and taking the place of someone who's on death row and sitting in the hole waiting the death penalty. But that person sitting in the hole was you and me. That person sitting in the prison of our own sin was you and me and the rest of the world. The more we are convicted about our sin, the more we see the darkness in which we naturally sit the prison of sin that we naturally sit, the more we cannot help but be amazed and absolutely, as the Holy Spirit does, convicted about righteousness. The righteousness that came from the Father through Christ Jesus, the one who comes down and he unlocks the door to our cell and he says, you're free, I'll take your place. You go ahead and you go out now and you live for me. I'll take your sin as, it's, as though it's mine and I'll give you my righteousness as though you did it. The great exchange, isn't it? And the Holy Spirit comes along and convicts us through that word of God to see that this is not just another guy who was good, who lived at a certain time in history. This is not just another human being who's better than most. He's perfect in every way as we needed to be. And then he gives it all away. He comes for the sole purpose of not only com completing his father's plan, as we talked about last week, but then the sole purpose of leaving again so that he might intercede for us and send the Holy Spirit back through the word of God to convict us. This is why Jesus came. 
You see how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, are so united that you can't separate them? Their plan, their purpose was all along to send Jesus, to take Jesus back, to send the Holy Spirit to continue working through that Word of God so that when we trust and rely on that Word of God just as Jesus did, then we remain, we remain convicted. Convicted about sin, convicted about His righteousness, and even more, convicted about judgment. And that's where sometimes I think we get a little bit off base. We think about God's judgment. When I say that, God's going to judge you in the end. Does your heart start to beat a little faster when you hear those words? Oh, oh, God's going to judge me. Hear those words differently today. Because normally when we think of God judging me, we think of, oh man, he's going to bring up all the past, he's going to bring up everything that I've said, and he's going to say everything, all the evil, and he's going to say to me, you can't get into heaven because I know everything you've done. I know all your thoughts. I know all the motivations behind those thoughts. I know why you did that to your spouse, why you said that to your child, why you said that to your parent, and I'm going to bring it all up at the end because that's what judges do. They, they bring it all out, all the evidence, and they lay it all out there. And that is, isn't that exactly what a judge does? The jury, of course, too. The judge looks at all the evidence, and he doesn't base his judgment on his own opinion. He doesn't base it on, oh, what does the human consensus think about this today? What's the basic general morality going around, floating around in the world? He doesn't do that either. He bases it on the evidence. What is the evidence? What does the Holy Spirit convict you today to say about your sin? Yes, I'm a sinner, right? Yes, I'm deserving of nothing from my God except eternal condemnation. But then what does the Holy Spirit tell you about the righteousness that Jesus has come to bring and to give you? Those who are dipped in the blood of the Lamb have no sin, and where there is no sin, there is no condemnation. Why not? Because as he says today, the ruler of this world has been condemned. The one who rules the things that it seems like going on in our world, when it seems like everybody in humanity and all the higher-ups and the powers that be in the world seem to be running amok and controlling everything going on around us. When it seems as though fear is the name of the game. When it seems as though the devil can whisper in our ear and tell us whatever he wants and we believe it. Don't. Don't listen. Instead, tune back in to the words that God gives to us through the Holy Spirit. That word of God which tells us, I've already defeated. He's already condemned. And all of his followers... You don't be, need to be afraid. You don't need to worry about all the past, your sins, your guilt, all the things that you should have done and didn't do. That's why I sent Jesus. Because he already did them for you. And to say I need to go and do more to, to please Jesus is to undo everything that he's done in your place. And to forget why he would send the Holy Spirit through his word in the first place to convict you that you don't need Jesus to stand right here in front of you and tell you just what he did to the disciples. You already have him in the word of God. You already have him as the Holy Spirit speaks to you out of his word and convicts you about your sin and the rest of the world. You already have that word of God in which you lean on and then you lead others to lean on as God uses you to speak about sin and about his own righteousness and about his judgment, the one passed already on Satan, on death, and on your own sin. So then he gives you everything you need. He would send his disciples away who were afraid, but he sends us away who are very often afraid too. Who can I rely on? What can I rely on? What is actually the truth? I'll send my counselor. I'll send the Holy Spirit to convict and convince you. My word is truth. 
to convince you to convince others. Don't rely on your own words, my dear friends. Go back to the Word of God. Go back to those blessed sacraments. Go back to those promises of God and take others to do the same. Rely on the Holy Spirit to convict you and the rest of the world about sin, about Jesus' righteousness, and about his judgment. We got work to do. Let's go do it. Amen. Please rise. God, which surpasses all understanding, then keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We pray. Almighty, eternal, heavenly Father, on the day of Pentecost, you poured out the Holy Spirit on your church, enabling your apostles to witness to all nations using your powerful word. We thank you that by your spirit you've called to faith in Christ Jesus, given power to believe your word and gathered into the fellowship of your holy church. Sanctify us that we, purged of our sins and unrighteousness, may be prepared for every good work in you. Help us by the witness of your Spirit to know more deeply and truly the Holy Scriptures, that we become increasingly wise for salvation, trusting in them alone and their power. Stir up your church, Lord. Work within her walls a zeal to seek the lost, to bind up the brokenhearted and to heal the afflicted, cheering all those who mourn. Give your Spirit room in our homes that he would lead every child who bears your name into the paths of love and obedience. Give every parent an understanding heart and gentle ways that together our families may adorn our faith in you with godliness and honor. To all those in trial or tribulation, the sick, the weary, the oppressed, the fearful, the needy, and the lonely, grant them the peace of Christ. Let their cry come to you, O Lord, and grant them all things needful. Lord, you occupy the highest heavens. Look down in mercy on our nation. Turn the hearts of our enemies to peace. Guard and protect us from the efforts of those who would seek to terrorize and destroy us. And stop those who use your name to excuse their evil. Continue to bless our land with the freedoms that have enabled us to worship you openly. Give us wise rulers who will govern with justice and equity and concern for the people under their rule. Finally, keep us in the faith, so that whether in life or in death, we will always be yours. Finally, through your Spirit, bestow your grace on each of us, that we may ever walk in the light of your presence, both here and the hereafter. It is in Jesus' name that we set these requests before your mercy seat, as we then join together in the prayer you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And we'll continue on page 21 with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, 
Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day kept his promise and poured out the Holy Spirit to empower his church to proclaim the gospel in all the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you, always. Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior strengthen and keep you in the true faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. O oh God, the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity, and we thank you that through him you've given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we willingly serve you day after day through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated, and we will close with our final hymn, 185. 